a lot of discussions um, going on with producers and with stores and, and with advisors uh, around lameness and sheep because we we have just uh, reintroduced uh, to the market our footbacks vaccine, so it's put us um, in discussion with the people and, and we do know that uh, lameness and sheep can be a fairly confusing and confronting issue at times and it certainly is at the moment. So we, uh, we sort of had a bit of discussion within the team, some of the territory managers threw up the idea that perhaps we should be doing a bit of an information session, not just on footbacks, but on all the issues to do with sheep lameness and uh, thus this has been born. Um, so we'll just uh, launch into it. Uh, feel free to put questions in on the chat box to summer as we go and we'll answer them as appropriate. Um, but there's a session at the end to answer questions as well. Um, so first thing we need to have a quick look at is uh, anatomy of the feet. We, well, the first thing we need to look at is identifying what the lameness issue is. And that, that can be for a number of different reasons. We always uh, panic about the feet, but there's lots of different reasons why sheep can be lame. And we need to do uh, an assessment of the animal and the group of animals to understand what the, the issue is. Um, we know there's lots of reasons that sheep can go lame. It might be a confirmation issue and a, um, a secondary lameness because of a poor confirmation. Um, there can be primary or secondary lesions, so we need to work out whether that uh, injury to the foot is, or dragging of the foot is because of a, uh, perhaps an arthritis or a, a stifle injury. Um, it might be, is it muscular or skeletal? Is it in the joints? Um, is it injury or infection in the joints or is it in the feet? Um, and the reality is that most lameness is in, in uh, all four-legged animals are uh, in the feet. And so if we, if we have a look at the anatomy of the foot, uh, it's an important thing to just have a bit of a, a picture in your head. The important things, we, we've got the uh, coronet around the top of the hoop, which is where the, the hoop wall grows from. Um, underneath that hoop wall is uh, the lamina propria, that, which basically supplies the is a blood supply to the hoof wall and to the health of the hoof. Um, if we look side on, we've, we've got uh, a basically a soft horn at the back of the heel and a hard horn towards the toe. If we look from underneath, which is probably the more important um, aspect to understand, we've got the two toes, we've got the sole of the foot, which is, uh, takes a lot of the weight. We've got the bulb of the heel, which is a soft part of the tissue and like it's, it's the true cushioning um, that allows the foot to absorb uh, impact and it's, it's basically a soft. Uh, cushion. Uh, we've got junctions between the, the skin and the horn of the hoof wall on the inside of the, of the inside of the foot um, on either side of the individual skin and that actually becomes an important junction when we're looking at things like foot rot because that is where you'll get breakdown of the integrity of the skin and the hoof horn and where you can start to do some diagnostics. Um, I think that's all that we need to do with that one. So if we're looking at, um, we sort of we're past the understanding of what the um, what we need to be looking at, and we're going into the investigation. We need to be looking at an assessment of the flock and the individual, and understanding that sample size is an important thing. It, it can be are we looking at three percent of the flock? Are we looking at ten percent of the flock? Um, all those things are important when we're trying to assess, uh, for instance, um, with foot rot. I keep talking about foot rot because that sample size is important. Um, with assessing whether we're looking at a virulent or a benign strain of foot rot, numbers are important in that in that scenario. And we also know that um, maybe if you've got an arthritis situation, it may be that uh, the number of lambs or affected may sort of impact on the decision whether to treat or whether to uh, um, impose on some sort of management program the following year. Um, so getting that sample size important. Uh, with with that, we can follow up with. Um, Laboratory testing, and a lot of the laboratory testing is all about taking samples and uh, and seeing what bugs are there. If we if we are looking at a joint, we might be taking um, a needle aspirate from a joint, or a, maybe a post mortem, some sort of a swab of some sort, and we're trying to identify whether it might be an erysipelas or a chlamydia, or it might be a um, a, a secondary infection after a landmarking um, contamination issue, and those sort of testings can give us guidance about. Uh, future actions, maybe we need to vaccinate, maybe we need to have a look at our landmarking or musing techniques for, for hygiene. Um, swabs can also be taken of the, of the feet, which is the picture that we've got there, and that, that might be when we're trying to work out, um, it, it is one of the tools we can use when we're trying to work out the virulence of, of a foot rot bacteria that we might have in, in the flock. And taking that swab can be tested to 
work out virulence, which we'll talk about a bit later. So once we've got our diagnosis, uh, that gives us a bit of a, a direction to uh, look at treatments according to that diagnosis and prevention in the future. Um, so we've got a few different, we're going to be focusing on, on the hoof or the foot. Um, we've got a few, um, to me, the three, the big three um, issues with lameness in the foot um, are basically scald or interdigital dermatitis. We then move into an abscess situation and that, can, that abscess might be in the heel or the toe and then we might be looking at something different again. It could be a foot rot and that foot rot infection can vary between benign and virulent. We'll, we'll go through those things in more detail. But there are a couple of other conditions that we need to keep in mind. And these are, um, I mean, shelly toe as such is, a, is not uncommon, especially in wet seasons and soft ground. And that's basically the, 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 the hoof wall is meant to wear off. Um, it, it keeps growing from the coronet. It's meant to wear off with, with uh, walking um, and movement. But if we get a wet season and soft ground, then that, that horn, that the wall of the hoof may not wear properly and you'll get the hoof wall curling around underneath, it can become quite uh, compacted with dirt and muck um, inside that overgrown hoof wall. And it can be a little bit confusing as to is this a significant issue, but often if you do it uh, with a pair of foot shears and a, and a bit of a clean up, you can see that it's purely a physical um, deformity as such, and that can be tr cleaned up with trimming. And, and when you get back, to, when we get back to dry seasons or hard ground, that will look after itself. You might also see a laminitis at times, and that can be secondary it's often second to a fee issue or some sort of stressful disease event. Um, you'll see that uh, perhaps in a grain overload situation or maybe um, people who put, have rams in sheds on hot feed will um, sometimes see a laminitis, laminitis if there's a change in diet and you'll see a shifting lameness and, and um, um, heat in the foot and discomfort. And again, that's not common, but it's important to know that th these things can happen because it's an important diagnosis. We know we can do something with that, um, manage the feed and the and the acute situation and have them back to normal fairly quickly. And we have a condition called strawberry foot rot, which basically talks about lesions that you might see um, around the coronet or slightly higher on the paston, uh, open lesions, and, and um, they look like growths or warts. They're usually to do with really wet conditions and infection with either, either dermatophilus, which is a bacteria that causes uh, fleece rot, or it might be an all virus, um, scabby mouth virus and if uh, if those bacterial viruses are transferred to the to that area of the foot perhaps with a, a sheep rubbing its its nose on its feet because its its nose might be itchy with the with the dermatophilus on the on the ears or the or the nose or or, or virus on the lips or, or mouth area then that bacteria can transfer to the foot and they can actually they can get quite nasty they can especially the dermatophilus can lead to secondary infections and a lot of swelling and and that in flood times um, you, know, you can sheep standing in water for an uh, extended length of time can actually end up with quite serious secondary um, septicemias as after after dermatophilus infection. So just understanding those things can happen and getting in, in, inspect, getting help and advice on those things is pretty important when you when you see them. If you don't know what you're looking at, um, get some help in to help you through it. So if we start with uh, the, the first of the big three. Um, scald is everyone knows. The word scald, it's, um, it's an overarching term um, and, a, and a pre often a precondition for secondary infections like foot abscess and foot rot. But scald is also known as ovine interdigital dermatitis and here's what it says. Basically, the, you get a dermatitis between the digits of the toe. Um, you see it with wet conditions uh, and uh, constant wet conditions. That softens the skin. Uh, you may also see um, secondary sort of physical trauma from perhaps long grass, sheep moving through long grass and scraping their toes uh, through that, the interdigital areas being scraped through long grass and there's trauma there. And so you get painful, reddened, uh, macerated skin and you can get secondary superficial infections that set up there. Um, and often that bacteria that sets up there is Fusobacterium necophorum. That's a bacteria that's shed in sheep species all the time very common uh, in the environment and an opportunistic bacteria that can set up in uh, wounds such as that um, at times. Now that's scald, um, maybe that's all you've got and, and there's no further damage and, uh, and you, can, um, you can address that with foot bathing, which we'll talk about and looking for dry ground um, and hopefully that's all you see. And I think that's actually very common this year. I think there's a lot of business, a lot of properties out there that are 
that don't normally run into problems with, say, foot rot or foot abscess. And this year, with the early break and the consistent wet weather, um, there is a lot of stall out there. But uh, um, some people, and it may be the case that you're getting further conditions as a result of that stall predisposing to things, and that's something we're looking at with foot abscess and foot rot. Now, if that's all that happens, that's fine. But if that damage to the skin can allow other bacteria to penetrate, rather than being superficial, it can actually enter the, the tissue of the foot. And and as we saw with the anatomy of the foot, you've got a um, you've got a hoof there containing bones and joints. And uh, if we get infection to those areas, it can get quite uh, serious lamenesses and, and conditions that are difficult to treat. Part of the thing with scald is it uh, can be very difficult to differentiate. Um, stalled from an early stage foot rot lesion. So that is probably something that people are concerned about is what am I looking at? And it's a fair question. Um, hopefully we can help you, uh, give you some guidance on where to go to, to help with that, with that diagnosis down the track. So how do we prevent that scald? It is about trying to find the high dry ground, which is easy to say and hard to do. I live in the irrigation areas on flat country. Thanks, I've got a sand hill so I can get sheep up on high ground if it gets really wet, but certainly there are some years here where um, um, I get quite challenged with um, a wet feet and scald and it can be a nightmare to manage. But if you can find the high dry, dry ground and, and utilise it, um, it will certainly help healing and it will reduce that trauma and lesions. Now the next stage of that, if we have to actually uh, intervene and try and manage the, the, the scald that is going on, we're looking at um, Foot bathing, uh, the common approach to foot bathe with zinc sulphate. Um, people also use um, formalin, which um, is probably less commonly used these days. It's, 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 it's um, probably OH and S issues make it less favoured. Um, it certainly does a good job, um, but zinc sulphate is probably a safer and it's still a very effective way to go. So zinc sulphate is bacteriostatic. In, in other words, it actually will stop the bacteria from multiplying and uh, if you foot bathe regularly, you'll actually manage that infection and hopefully promote healing of that individual area. And you'll see hopefully pretty good improvement pretty quickly with regular foot bathing. And we'll talk about foot bathing down the track. Um, with, with the next two conditions we want to talk about, we, we know that foot abscess and foot rot actually do follow on from a scald. Um, the two situations occur if, um, if we get a Dicelobacter nodosus bacteria invading the foot through that through that macerated interdigital skin, that bacteria is associated with foot rot. Um, once that is up and running, you get underrunning of the hoof of the heel of the hoof. Uh, that bacteria can contaminate the pasture and be transferred to other sheep. Um, the other thing that we see is if we get a if, if it's a different bacteria that might invade that that lesion between the toes, such as again a Fusobacterium or a Truporella, blah blah. It actually doesn't matter. There's lots of bacteria out there that can penetrate that damaged skin again. And that will actually invade the tissue and, and present as a different condition, foot abscess. And that's an infection of the soft tissue uh, and the heel and the toe and can break out in different spots rather than the underrunning of the heel. So if we look at foot abscess. Um, very often it presents in one foot, uh, but it can be multiple feet. You can, have, you can have sheep in so much discomfort that they just won't move, they won't stand up. Um, usually the actual foot itself is swollen and hot, so you'll feel, you put your hand on the, uh, on the coronet and above the coronet, you'll feel heat, um, you'll see swelling, um, you'll see the toes might be uh, spread apart because it, the, the infection might be in the soft tissue between the toes. Um, as the disease progresses, the condition progresses, you'll see pus. You don't see pus with um, foot rot, but you do see it with foot abscess. And that, that uh, pus can break out, it's basically the abscess is trying to relieve itself, it can break out between the toes, as you can see in that photo, the inset photo there, or it might actually break out at the coronet level, uh, which you can see in that bigger photo. And you've actually got white or green pus there, um, and that uh, will often relieve pain, but you've got an ongoing infection there that, um, that needs attention if you're going to get them healed, uh, get them fixed up. The heel abscess is the most common, as is pictured there, um, but you can also get an abscess in the toe, which is a lot less swelling, but it's extremely painful and it can be hard to diagnose. But if, you, uh, if you're if you looking at sheep's feet and you put a bit of pressure on, on the toe area, whether it's with a, um, basically like a hoof tester in the horse world or maybe your, your pairing, your foot pairs, um, just pressing on different spots, you can actually, if you can localise that pain to, to the toe, and then you can find where that abscess is sitting and, and relieve the, 
relieve that pressure, you'll get um, pretty good results in terms of pain relief very quickly. Um, so how do we prevent foot abscess? Well, we've got to think about, again, managing the scald because that predisposes to a secondary foot abscess. And so we're talking about uh, dry, high dry ground and foot bathing, but other things we can think about. Um, if you're in the middle of a foot, rock, uh, foot abscess outbreak, um, it's very important or, uh, to try and avoid practice that might cause damage to the feet and, and things like yarding, um, heavy use uh, into muddy or stony uh, yards or paddocks or pushing them along laneways without giving them the time to place their feet where they choose to. Uh, if you're rushing them, they can bruise their feet um, and that bruising allows, it's a nice environment for bacteria to set up and cause an infection. So just, just taking your time with and avoiding uh, bruising of the feet is important. Um, monitoring condition score is important, especially with rams. You don't, rams don't need to be four and a half score. They need to be fit but not fat. And if you can manage that with them, then they'll be less um, prone to foot abscess. If you if your if your if your rams if you seem to get a lot of foot abscess in your rams, there's you know there's obviously things to do with uh, stalled and managing that. But you might have a look at your condition score and say, well, maybe I don't need to run them at um, at, uh, at full noise fatness. They can be backed off a little bit to do that, still do their job, and maybe you'll see less foot abscess. But this year, there's a lot of foot abscess around, lots of heavy sheep. Lots of wet conditions, an early break in the season, and I think a lot of you know these wet years and these lots of feed around and heavy use, heavy sheep, you do see a lot of foot abscess. Um, thank Teresa? you, Jim. Just before you go any yep. further, um, yep. I just wanted to remind people that we are able to answer questions if they can uh, send a chat through um, by clicking on the chat icon. And, and Jim, if you just quickly tap on your screen, it should come up so that we can clearly point out it's a chat icon or is it not going to come up? I might be wrong. No, I don't think so. No, it oh, doesn't no. come up. No. Um, That's all right. If you click on your screen, everyone who's listening, um, there are icons that will pop up. It's like a chat symbol. You can open the chat and then if you select um, from the drop down all panellists, then uh, we can monitor those questions as they come through. Thanks, Jim. No worries. So if we are in the middle of a, of a and a foot abscess outbreak, um, you, there are things you can do. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, the intervention requires uh, antibiotics uh, into the individual animal. Um, early treatment can be very effective. Um, um, we need to try and get them into the dry. Sometimes you might need to get them into, into the shed to, to antibiotics into the feet. It's good if you can get the feet dry, into a dry area. Uh, they'll work a lot better. Um, um, and a long-acting antibiotic of some sort. If you need to be talking, you're consulting with your vet uh, about this one. Every vet will have their own preference, whether it be long-acting teramice, a tetracycline, or a, a, a penicillin. Um, sometimes you need to do a repeat treatment, but if you treat early, um, you'll often get a good result. Um, if you treat, if, you, if the condition has gone on too long and maybe infection has uh, got into one of the joints in the in the foot or above the foot, then um, that damage uh, can be permanent, and um, if, if you might not get 100% recovery, and um, it may be a situation where you might have to cull that animal because once a foot's deformed and you've got a spreading of the toes or a, or an arthritis in the joint, a septic arthritis of some sort or some sort of, um, you know, they may have recovered but they're still damaged in the joint, then they are then prone to, to uh, further um, abscesses down the track. So once they're out of a, a withhold and uh, they're fit to load. Um, it, it may be a good opportunity to cash them out and um, remove the problem, potential problem with that sheep next time. What's going on? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> right. So we, we, that's your foot abscess story. Um, We'll move on to the next of the big three, and that's foot rot. Um, as we saw in that, uh, we saw in the early photo um, with scald that uh, foot rot can present in a number of different ways. We saw a we saw a benign foot rot in that photo that looked like scald, and you can get to this point here. We've got a severe uh, lesion. We've basically had the the underrunning of the hurlants worked up the hoof wall. We've lost the whole hoof wall there, and um, it's obviously a pretty severe and um, painful situation. It's a contagious, so foot rot's a contagious bacterial disease in sheep and goats. It's caused by Dicalobacter nidosis 
Now that bacteria, it produces enzymes as bacteria do. They have all sorts of amazing ways of working um, and providing for their survival. And the particular enzymes that uh, Dicelobacter nodosus produce, they target the, um, the, the, the so they soften the, the horn skin junction uh, and and work their way underneath the heel and uh, get toward and move towards the hoof wall. Um, it's a severe and debilitating disease, and uh, with Dicella bactinidosis, there are multiple um, serotypes, and uh, within serotypes, there are different degrees of severity or virulence of the different serotypes, as well as between the different strains as well. So it's a, it can be a complicated um, disease to discuss when you get into it, but uh, there's lots of variation, which we'll talk about. Now, the impact of foot rot, it's a, you know, it's a, a Serious condition for the sheep industry a has a serious impact in uh, in the foot rot prone areas. It's uh, it's an animal welfare issue. It will cost you money in terms of weight loss and re reduced growth rates, uh, decreased wool production. Um, you'll see reduced fertility in ewes and rams, and that's as a direct result of um, uh, body weight and um, an animal that gets that. Uh, goes through a spring with um, foot rot may actually recover, but it will not be in the body condition it should be in. If it was wasn't infected, and so you uh, miss the opportunity to have those animals at peak body body condition score for joining. And the other thing that happens is if you're uh, looking at um, trying to manage the foot rot outbreak that you got, it might involve culling, and everybody hates getting rid of young sheep. So uh, and genetics that you're selecting for, and obviously. Um, you're not getting paid for as much for them if they're going out light in condition and potentially straight the abattoirs because you've got a condition you can't put through the yards. Um, it's important to understand that with foot rot, as with any disease, um, there's always interactions between the, the, the infection, which is the bacteria in this case, uh, with the environment and with the animal. And those three things have to um, all be lined up for foot rot to express properly. And, We'll go through this quickly, but if you've got an animal that is less susceptible to foot rot, it might be a British bred animal or a, a crossbred, they're a bit less susceptible to foot rot than uh, merinos are, then you've got an animal factor there. And within Benetop, within within um, breeds, there, there are going to be individuals that are more susceptible or more resistant to, to an infection as well. If you've got a, a dry environment, um, foot rot to express and to spread needs a wet, warm environment, so that environment uh, picture is uh, very important and you need the bacteria there as well, which can be confusing at times and is what people are looking at at the moment. Do I have foot rot? Well, it depends. You, you can actually do swabs and work out whether that bacteria is there and then go from there. But um, we'll go through these things individually. Um, as I've discussed, that the Dicelobacter uh, in Australia, there have been 10 uh, different serotypes diagnosed in Australia. That bacteria, and this is an important part of management and understanding the disease, it can only survive seven days on pasture, no matter how, um, and that's got to be the right conditions. It's the best condition, seven days on pasture, so it's warm, moist conditions. It can, it has been found to survive up to 14 days in the soil in muddy, in sort of muddy, warm, moist conditions. But the pasture spread is the most important thing to think about. So if you can smell a pasture for uh, two weeks, seven days, and it, um, if it's if it's just pasture-based stuff, but if you can get it pasture free of, of infected sheep for 14 days, you've got a clean paddock, but that's important to um, when you're trying to manage spread. Um, but we also know that the bacteria, is uh, it's, uh, it can survive. Its preferred place to, to live is actually in the hoof, it's, um, it's, and it can survive indefinitely in the hoof for a number of years. Even if you go through a couple of spread periods of the hoof sock, if, if you don't go through the spread period side for a couple of years, um, that bacteria can still be sitting in the hoof there quietly doing nothing, maybe progressing a little bit in terms of the infection, but with the right conditions, um, it can multiply, uh, grow, and then go out and pasture, which is one of the nightmares of trying to find clean sheep if you're buying sheep. Um, it's, it's a challenge for the industry, and there's lots of different approaches, but biosecurity and understanding, keeping those sheep quarantined uh, until you get a spread period to prove that they haven't got foot rot is is a tactic that a lot of people try and use. It, it's also easy to say and hard to do. Now, again, as I mentioned before, those bacteria, that bacteria Dicella bactinidosis produces enzymes that damage the foot, and that that fact allows you to test for virulence because those enzymes can be uh, can be isolated um, from the different uh, strains of the 
foot rot bacteria, you'll get benign strains and virulent strains. Um, according to which enzymes, the virulence of the, of the um, enzymes that are the, the damage they can do. Um, and the severity of the actual disease will depend on the number of strains you might have on, on, the, on your farm or in those sheep and the virulence of those strains. And those lesions can be scored. So the first thing we can do, we can actually look at feet. We can actually um, sample a number of sheep from that flock. Normally what you do is you go to the lame sheep and you look and uh, you can actually give them scores. And if you look there, we've got um, a range of different, um, we've got uh, a normal looking foot there with the hair between the toes and nice healthy skin. You've then got a score one lesion and that's impossible really to differentiate from a, um, a just a straight skull, but that, that the, the dicalobactin doses could be sitting there on that skin. If we swab that skin, we might find it. Um, we can start to be more suspicious of foot rot bacteria being there if we start to see underrunning of the of lesions on the inside of the heel there. So we see that red hot spot there and if you start looking there, there's a fairly typical um, fibrinous type lesion at that junction there. Um, and as it progresses along, we'll get um, more underrunning of the heel. Uh, and you can start to measure these things. You can get, if you go to five mils, um, and you've got uh, of underrunning um, and the lesion between the toes. Well, we can actually classify that as a 3A lesion. And so it goes on. The further the underrunning, which you can see there, we're seeing a slow progression. Um, we'll get three, three Bs out to fours. Um, with, with score uh, four, you're actually starting to see it's at the underrunning extending out the walls and the outside edge of the sole of the foot. And when you get out to score fives, you've got severe necrotizing inflammation of the deeper tissue of the, of the wall of the foot and separation of the hard horn and the actual, the actual outside wall can separate away. And those, that scoring, um, the severity of the lesions, the number of lesions within the flock allow you to categorise the presentation of the foot rot that you're looking at. And so thus we get uh, um, benign strains where you don't see, you, you see lesions that are only, uh, we don't see many score four lesions at all. Um, we see mostly lesions of one to three A, so that mild underrunning and out to virulent you're seeing 20% um, of lesions that are quite severe. So a lot of this scoring, um, when you, Inspecting a plot, its timing is everything. Um, maybe you need to come back in two weeks and have another look and see what uh, changes may have occurred because you can go from a uh, an early stage virulent foot rot that might look fairly benign into a pretty severe situation in as quick as seven to fourteen days. Really, so, yeah, monitoring is important. We have, when you are talking to people about foot rot, there's lots of discussion. Um, intermediate foot rot isn't a term that is recognised anymore, but uh, nonetheless, foot rot is a, is a spectrum. It goes from minor, um, minor damage through to quite severe and virulent strains, and it's a spectrum. So in, there is obviously a spot in the middle there um, that is a clinical presentation that um, needs to be addressed. And it's, it's the, when with regulatory bodies, that's the nightmare area. Is, is what we're looking at here a benign strain that's just the, the environmental conditions have allowed to express quite to its extreme? Or is it, a, um, is it a virulent strain that isn't expressing that much at the moment because we've got the environment uh, not allowing it to uh, express to its full extent? Um, we'll talk about what, what we can do to further diagnose that. But um, just in terms of looking at feet, if you're looking at your own feet and wondering at what you've got, um, in general, intermediate foot rot is treated like a virulent strain. Um, it's very, it can be difficult to manage because um, we don't know whether we should be trying to, how much production is it costing us. Um, it, it, can be, it can be something that only turns up every three or four years or it might be something that um, you live with all the time. But certainly there are tools, foot bathing and, and vaccination can aid in control of an intermediate strain and even hopefully give you the opportunity to eradicate if if that is part of what you want to do. Um, part, of the ish, part of that Venn diagram we talked about is we do have animal factors. Um, different breeds are more susceptible than others. Um, uh, Merinos are more susceptible than British breeds. Age is not so much of an issue. It, 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 different infections can occur at any age, including lambs, and maternal antibodies don't provide any protection. Um, so you can, get, you can actually get foot rot infections um, in lambs at foot, um, 
in, in the right seasons um, and you might have uh, in the first two or three weeks of life and I think that's happening quite a bit at the moment. There are lots of people uh, reporting to me they're seeing sheep with uh, four, uh, four feet that are showing signs of scald and who knows what that's going to develop into and again that's a case of monitoring. We look at the environmental factors, rainfall is important. Um, this bacteria spreads on pasture in wet conditions. Uh, it can progress within the animal when it's dry, but it doesn't actually spread um, when it's dry and hot. Uh, temperature, you need uh, greater than 10 degrees for it to spread, so it won't spread through the dead of winter in the cold parts of the, of the country, um, but that obviously the lesions are there and the foot is uh, sore and you'll still see lameness, but you're not getting spread and you'll see greater spread with lush pastures. So that just meant, I mean, the conditions there for a bacteria to survive. If you've got uh, nice moisture and conditions on pastures, a bacteria can survive for longer. And so it will sit there for seven days and infect the next damaged foot that comes along. How does it get onto your farm? It's usually introduced by an infected animal, or it is introduced by an infected animal, whether that be a sheep or a goat. And we know that cattle can actually carry the bacteria for short term. Um, a lot of unknowns in the cattle in the cattle story, um, but we do know that certainly the bacteria can survive on the feed of cattle for a, a length of time. Um, once that introduced animal, whether it be bought in or through the fence, through the, from the neighbour, down the road or down the laneway that you use every now and then, um, if that animal um, it can, can, can contaminate the pasture, uh, that bacteria will sit there and wait for the next at-risk animal to come along and pick up the bacteria. So again, We've talked about it, but I'll repeat it, that individual skin needs to be damaged and the wet conditions and, and allow that bacteria to survive and be ready to jump on board. Um, so if we think about that, then we know that the spread, uh, the danger times for spread and expression of disease are going to be the spring and the autumn uh, when it's wet and warm. Um, and that allows us some tactical, some planning. Uh, we can concentrate with some control programs uh, to manage um, uh, spread period to try and man to minimise the amount of spread um, and then we can actually look at trying to actually control how much infection we have in the flock by concentrating in the dry times uh, when we know we're not going to get spread between inspections and culls and treatments. So it does allow a plan to be developed and if you want to go down that path there's lots of good people out there within departments and private practice and rock contractors who have a lot of experience can help you set up programs and, 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 and help you plan a, a pathway. I think I saw a question pop up there, Summer, about um, deer. Do deer carry the bacteria? And um, that comes up quite, quite often. And I think the consensus is they may well carry for a short length of time. Um, they are bipedal. So the, the same situation exists with their foot that they have into digital areas where the bacteria could sit and be carried. But again, for how long? We'd actually end up running an actual foot rot expression in deer, to my knowledge. I've never looked at one, but um, I, I suspect it's just a, it can transmit rather than um, for short periods of time. So if we look at foot rot management, we're trying to control through that spread period. Uh, the aim of control is to reduce the number of new animals infected, which minimises reduction loss. That allows a cash flow to keep rolling through and hopefully fund any eradication program or some control program you might want to go down. It improves welfare. Um, you know, foot, so virulent foot rot is a welfare issue. And um, it's one of the reasons why, there's lots of reasons why um, we need to control foot rot, but welfare is a, is a large part of it. And also by minimising spread, uh, it maximises the chance of eradication. The less sheep that uh, you um, have infected, uh, the less chance there are of missing something at the um, eradication phase. So tools for controlling a foot bathing, which we'll talk about, foot trimming, which is both diagnostic to actually try and work out where the, uh, what the infection is and how bad it is. Um, it's also a good tool to actually, we don't want to be pairing back so that the feet are bleeding um, we've learnt, uh, again, that's a welfare issue. We, we don't want to do more damage than good by using foot pairers. Um, we use it for diagnostic procedures and maybe to um, open up, say, a shelly hoof um, to, to allow some of that foot bathing treatment to actually penetrate foot a bit better. 
Uh, we, we look at pasture management, so spelling paddocks for, for 14 days is going to guarantee you a, um, a clean paddock to move on to. It may be culling uh, those chronic animals that won't, um, that are, you're looking at in the summertime and don't recover, that don't, that don't um, you know, foot rot can, can be self-healing, but you have animals that won't recover. And if you, you don't want them uh, sitting there ready to contaminate next year, and they may also be non-productive anyway. Um, antibiotics are a useful tool at times. They will were, they were reduce infections, but they also, they don't guarantee, they may also hide infections as any, as any treatment can. So um, the other part of the antibiotic usage is um, we are under scrutiny with the veterinary world and the farming world is we are uh, custodians of uh, good practice with antibiotics and manage antimicrobial resistance. So antibiotics is something that we should be avoiding if we can. If we've got tools, other tools, we should be using them. And um, that, that's all the management tools I talked about as well as vaccination, so, which is another tool for control. Um, we talk about foot pathing. There's a couple of different approaches. Um, it's, uh, a lot of people will use walkthrough foot baths, um, but um, there's a lot of there's also a lot of setups and a lot of businesses that will have, are set up to actually allow sheep to stand in a foot bath for up to five minutes and, and longer at times, to, uh, which is a tactic that is recommended by some um, good advisors. Um, if you're going to use a walkthrough foot bath, they need to be eight metres long and um, Depending on the season, you might need to be going every seven days with that to actually um, to keep that bacterial infection um, under control. Um, if you go along with that, the bacteria may uh, get a hold and get a roll on again and uh, cause more damage to the foot. And the recommended um, concentration for zinc sulfate as a foot bath is 10%. Uh, we discussed last night, there were questions about um, formalin. I didn't actually include formalin in this discussion. I grew up using formalin foot baths and foot rotty sheep and I think it's why I've got no hair and cross-eyed perhaps. Um, it's, it is a carcinogen. It's, um, it's nasty to use. It's very good. It, it hardens the hoof wall. It can also potentially wall off infections inside the foot. And um, as Fliss mentioned last night, I'll steal that thunder because she brought this up last night and it was a good point that um, using um, zinc sulfate uh, if you're using formula and you, and you need to switch to, to, or you want to switch to zinc sulfate for whatever reasons, uh, advice or um, OH nest thinking, there's, you need to, it's, it's going to be two or three weeks or longer potentially before that zinc sulfate can be effective in a, in a hoop that has been well um, conditioned and become hardened by formula and treatments. So that's something to consider. You may not want to switch um, mid, mid control period perhaps. There's long, uh, one of the tactics that people use uh, long and um, is a longer term foot bathing arrangement where you might stand those sheep in, the, in a solution of 20% zinc sulfate um, for 15 to 60 minutes. Um, there's some good practitioners out there who uh, recommend it and if you've got the resources and the, and the, app and, the, uh, and, and the dedication to use that approach, I'm, I'm told it's a very effective approach. Um, there's also a couple of other products, foot bath, Using foot baths, eradicate, um, which has got a copper salt and 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 foot right, which is a um, um, uh, basically zinc sulfate with um, a detergent that allows better better penetration of the foot. Um, those products are out there, and, and they're uh, they you can you can approach those, find Google them, have a yarn to the people who sell them, and um, you know they're good products. Um, with any products. None of these will guarantee an eradication, but they'll certainly make the job of inspecting feet in the summertime a smaller job. Um, did I see a question there somewhere about how to make a 10% solution? Yes. Um, basically, it's uh, um, yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it just pops up, so but I think well, it's a good question. Um, basically, it's um, it's 10 kilos of, of um, zinc sulfate, which comes in powdered form. Um, Gave most, I gather there's a bit of a shortage at the moment, which reflects the season that we're having. So 10 kilos into basically 90 litres of, of water. Um, it's, it's pretty stable. You can, um, you, you can actually keep reusing that, that uh, solution, even though it's dirty and horrible. You, you probably do need to clean your foot baths out to make sure there is enough uh, depth in the foot bath so that the, foot, the whole foot is being covered. But certainly you can, um, 
you know, a, a dirty zinc sulphate footpath is a very common thing because we're walking sheep, lots of sheep through in a in a wet muddy season. Um, but that's if you keep topping up that uh, solution with that footpath, cleaning it out, shoveling out perhaps every now and then, and uh, topping up with another 10% zinc sulphate solution, they can sit there and um, be quite effective for an extended length of time. So if we talk about vaccination, um, which is one of the reasons we've, there are a couple of different options, but the benefits of vaccination basically, we're, we're boosting the immune system of that sheep, like any vaccination. Now, how much we, how much we uh, boost it is, uh, is always part of the discussion with why there's a couple of different vaccines out there. Um, but if you're boosting, boosting the immunity of the sheep, you're doing a few things. You're reducing the severity of infection that an individual might have to the point where actually you can cure um, an infection. You can boost the immune system such that it will actually repel the infection that's existing. Um, you will reduce the number of uh, sheep that are infected in that, in that vaccinated group because they won't pick up their, they won't, you know, some of them won't, they'll be actually not become infected because their immune system fights off the challenge. So thus it reduces spread and it also, as a benefit, reduces the amount of antibiotic usage. So there's a few benefits there, specifically about vaccinations. There are a couple of options for vaccinations um, now, which we're going to talk about. Um, we've got uh, a multivalent vaccine. Multivalent means um, it has multiple multiple strains or serotypes of, of, of Dicelobacter nodosis in the vaccine. That is our, that is the Cooper's foot vax. Uh, that product's been around for a long time. It's um, we'll talk about in more detail, but the, the, the newer and um, you know, the, the, the approach that um, is exciting um, is that we have vaccines that are only one or two strains and they induce a much better immunity. Um, they are need to be property, it's a different approach. They're property specific and uh, it's, you need to be actually identifying what strains are on your farm, which requires some veterinary input, culturing, um, a bit of cost up front, but you then get a vaccine tailored to your farm. And if you're lucky enough to only have a couple of strains on your farm, you can get an eradication in one season, which is great. And what we, you know, if we never saw food rot again, it would be a wonderful thing. So it, as I said, it involves uh, individual farm cultures and typing, and, and, and the vaccine is that the strains are sitting there um, ready to be to combine, the vaccines are sitting there ready to be combined and custom made for your farm. It's a stronger and longer lasting immune response. It's an uh, effective tool if if the typing exercise identifies all strains on farm. And this, this is some of the frustration where if a farm has multiple strains and about 50%, my understanding is 50% of farms will have more than two strains on them. So you might clean up a couple of strains and then you'll have to go again because you've still got uh, lesions, you need to do more typing and it's how far do you go. And part of the frustration, part of the reason footbacks is back on the market is that um, if you go down the path of trying to use it, eradicate using vaccines, these monovalent and bivalent vaccines, you've then got to try and make sure your, your biosecurity is spot on. Um, you've, you've still got to do inspections because even though they're very, very good, um, there are still non-responders that you have to try and find to make sure they don't reinfect the flock. So some farms will require multiple programs, which can lead to some frustration and repeated costs, and that's just how it is. Um, and that's putbacks. We had consultant, we've had consultants and animal health advisors come to us and say, can we bring the multivalent strain back? Because there are some situations where we need it because we can't. We have we have many strains on farm and we have issues with trying to get um, the biosecurity right or a dry period to do inspections. For in the, this is a really good um, resource for anyone who's looking at foot rot, this website. Um, there's some good resources there put up by the South Australian and Tasmanian Department, City University, and all, all the state departments have got good resources for foot rot. Uh, this site takes you to a couple. There's also on there a really good just released report on um, vaccine best practice. And it's looking at the advantages, of the, the pros and cons of both the monovalent and the monovalent bivalent approach or, um, or not and whether there is a place for the multivalent vaccine. So it's a good, healthy, independent discussion that I'd encourage everyone to have a look at. It's, it's great. Um, and I've left it up there long enough, so I hope you've written that down. But if you need to find it, um, um, 
it's an on the all.com site. Um, it's your levies being put to good use, so have a look at it. If we move to the multivalent vaccine, um, this this product has been around for a long time. I grew up with it. We used it at home on my family farm at Crookall back in the late 80s. My, I part funded my university degree by doing a foot rot eradication program on our own farm. My brother and I hooked in. We used foot vaccines to reduce the amount of uh, disease on farm and we did, over three years, we did um, inspections and we did manage to eradicate foot rot from our farm. We ended up having to cull a couple of mobs of weathers, but um, I tell that story because people sort of say, oh, well, it's not that good. Foot vax isn't that good. It, eradicating foot rot isn't really about the vaccines or the foot bathing. It's actually about the inspection, the summertime inspection, and identifying those sheep and doing a proper job then to me. And no matter what you do, whether it's foot bathing, vaccinating with a bivalent vaccine, vaccinating with a multivalent vaccine, the critical time is the summer inspection. And if you can get a um, summer inspection, if you can get three three summer inspections in over a couple of summers and you've got to, and do it thoroughly and do it well, then you've got a pretty good chance of uh, getting eradication. The problem is a lot of places don't get the opportunity to get um, two or three inspections in because they have wet summers and uh, that's part of the challenge. And then where do you find clean sheep from as well? The other part of, of foot, any foot rot vaccine is it reduces the need for pairing and foot bathing um, and that can be pretty critical when you are through a spread period. If you're if you've got used lambing, the last, well, you can't, you physically can't um, bring sheep in to do foot bathing. You're going to cause lots of disruption. Some, perhaps the sheep aren't walking, uh, lots of mismothering. So where these foot rot vaccines can be very useful is actually uh, managing that production, um, managing the impact of disease so that your, feet, your, your sheep stay upright, uh, keep milking, keep eating, uh, keep rearing lambs and um, getting you through that spread period. Um, which is an important part of the thinking of why should I use a vaccine or not, it can be very, very useful. And this, I'm going to let Fliss take over after this slide, but uh, we did talk about um, the fact that in Australia there are 10 strains being diagnosed. The foot vax vaccine has got nine serografts in it, um, and so it gives a wide range of protection against infection. It doesn't contain the M strain, which is quite a nasty strain of bacteria. So if you uh, you probably know about it if you've got the M strain because you'll have worked with your consultant uh, or your um, your department people and you may have had that identified. And that that if you've got M strain, it requires a discussion with your advisors about what to, what to do about that. It may be that you need to go to your, your monovalent strains um, as part of the program. Now I'm uh, going to hand over to Felicity now to, to walk us through the last part of this. Um, so Fliss, I'll you tell me when you want to shift or I'll try and guess and we'll go from there. Thanks very much, Jim. Yeah, so I'll be quick forward one. So just a little bit on the vaccine program for foot backs. It's a one mil dose to sheep. It goes under the skin on the side of the neck behind the ear. So pretty much the same as, as a lot of the vaccines that we're used to using. In a sheep that hasn't been um, given foot vax before, we need two vaccinations, ideally six weeks apart and no more than 12 months apart. So that gives you a little bit of flexibility in, in getting your vaccine program set up before the start of a, a spread period. The really important point of this is that that second dose or that booster dose should be given as close to possible as that spread period um, as we can kind of predict with the weather. So as Jim mentioned, the more strains or serotypes that we put in the vaccine, the kind of less immune response we get from that animal, which shortens the protective period of that vaccine. So really important in order to get the maximum benefit out of that vaccine to get that booster dose as close to possible as that spread period as we can. For sheep that have had those two um, shots initially, then we can give a single booster dose prior to any um, potential spread period over the next 12 months. So if we get them set up um, for the spring spread period, but then we look like we're going to have a, a wet autumn, we can then booster that um, protection again prior to that autumn break. Um, the, the one thing to remember there is 
that we can't have longer than 12 months between boosters. So if there's longer than 12 months, so we get a couple of dry years and you're not seeing foot rot, you'd have to start that two-shot program again. So that's the main one with those ones. We flick forward then. A couple of precautions with using foot backs. Um, it is, as Jim mentioned, an oil-based vaccine. So we can see a local reaction or a lump at the site of injection that will usually re resolve itself over three to six weeks. So usually not an issue. It is important to always be careful of your vaccination technique. So using clean needles and clean um, vaccination equipment um, and changing needles regularly um, to help to try to avoid those vaccine site reactions. Um, if vaccinating within two to three months of slaughter with those reactions, we might see a little bit of increased carcass trimming. So really important to be aware of that if you're using the vaccine. The other thing to be aware of is there has been some mild local discoloration of the wool at the site of injection for two to three months. So also to be aware of um, when you're choosing to vaccinate your sheep. Um, the one thing we also have to be aware of, obviously, is when we give a vaccine, we're asking the body uh, to respond with its immune system, um, which can have effect in rams pre-joining. So we don't want to affect that um, sperm production in the last you know, six to eight weeks prior to, to um, joining. So really important if you're choosing to vaccinate um, those rams pre-joining is that we try to get that in a good four to six weeks before, before that joining period. We just flip forward there. Another really important aspect of, of foot facts, and I'm not sure where everyone on the line is from, but in those states where we have a government control um, of virulent foot rot because it's a notifiable disease, uh, the use of foot facts will require a permit from your chief veterinary officer. So those states are New South Wales, South Australia, and Western Australia. We just click through. So in those states, it is a notifiable disease with a government control, control program in place. So the first thing is that we need to be able to diagnose that you actually do have virulent foot rot. That's the first step. From there, if, as the aim is eradication, you'll be working with your, your government department on an eradication program. And if they believe and you believe that foot back fits into that control and eradication program, we can apply for a permit in those states. So if you're from New South Wales, that would uh, get you to approach the local, your local land services. In South Australia, that's um, a contact with your, your local PERSA. And in WA, that's your contact through DPERT. And if anyone needs any help or guidance in wanting to uh, get in contact with um, those departments, they're more than happy to, uh, more than welcome to contact Jim or myself, and, and we can uh, point you in the right direction for each of those states. So if we just sum up a little bit about foot rot eradication, the one thing I would say is um, it does take planning and commitment. So as you probably can see from, from everything Jim's gone through today, uh, lame mission and sheep, and in fact, foot rot can be a really complicated disease on farms. So if we get to the point where we have a diagnosis of, of virulent foot rot and it's practical, practical for us to go into an eradication program, we really want to start planning that well in advance. It may not be possible in a single year and it may not be possible at all depending on your environment, um, your setup to your neighbours and things like that. So it really does require a bit of thought and planning and, and good support from um, your animal health advisors, your vets. Um, consultants or your government department. It's really important to resource a program. So these, as Jim would have alluded to, often involve um, a lot of inspection of sheep feet. So having the infrastructure in place for handling um, and doing these inspections, having infrastructure in place for foot baths and having the labour required is really, really important if we're aiming at eradication. Also be prepared to cull sheep. So while we've talked about a whole range of kind of control and treatment methods, um, there will always be those sheep that don't respond to this. So there will be some culling required in order for you to work towards eradication. There's a focus on control in the spread period so we can get, as Jim was saying, those number of infected sheep as, sheep as low as possible. 
going into a dry um, summer so we can work at eradicating that disease. Um, we inspect and cull during that dry period and after we've done that, it's really important then to be really observant of what happens during your next spread period because that will really help you get a gauge on how well you're doing it trying to control and eliminate uh, that bacteria on the farm. So if we kind of jump right back to the start now and have some key take home messages from the whole presentation, um, what I would say is it's really important to, to identify the problem and get a diagnosis before we jump into to treatment or control. What you decide to do on farm is going to be very different if you're dealing with scold or a benign foot rot than what you're going to do if you're dealing with a very virulent strain of foot rot. So really important to, to get all those um, people involved that can help you get, get a good diagnosis in place before you plan your your um, treatment or control methods. Really important to monitor your flock closely for signs of lameness. The earlier that we can pick up a lot of these problems, the easier it is for us to try to sort some of them out. So being really diligent at that. And I think a season like this where we've got a lot of expression of a lot of those different types of diseases has shown producers just how quickly these problems can develop in a flock if we don't pay attention to them. And I think the last big point that we probably haven't spent as much time um, talking about is probably worth it, is the importance of biosecurity. So um, either preventing a disease like virulent foot rot coming into the flock or keeping it out once you've gotten rid of it really comes down to um, having a really good biosecurity plan in place. And a lot of your um, animal health advisors or government agencies can help you go through that process. And, and a big part of that is, is dealing with purchases um, being very um, uh, diligent at looking at the sourcing, sourcing of purchases where we can't, can, and also the quarantine and introduction of, of animals on, into the flock is really important. So there is a lot of support in this area. So um, seeking advice from your animal health advisors, from your private veterinarians or government departments are really going to give you a lot of good support in, in helping you decide how we're going to tackle some of these issues. If you'd like to speak to, to Jim, myself, or any other members of the um, Cooper's Animal Health Tech Team, so Jane or Michelle, and you can contact the customer service number and they'll pop you through to us. Or if you go to the Cooper's website and the contact contact us page that's there, all our contact details will be uh, listed there as well as the areas that we cover. So you can um, seek out some local support. Right. And so just the other one that, yep, just, just oh, sorry, got territory, yeah, territory managers out there that are a good contact point as well. They will uh, point you in the right direction if they um, can't help you, but uh, they, they are, uh, you've got plenty of them around. They're good, good uh, operators with good knowledge and good contact. So they're another one to go to as well. Definitely. So yep, I think that great was one. for the main. So if yeah, you have thanks, any questions, Felicia, so We do. Um, the first question I have is, can I infect a sheep if I trim a clean foot after I've trimmed a foot rot infected sheep? So my, I, yes, I would say that's an important thing. So. Um, if you are using pairs, and, and foot rot contractors are very conscious of this, they will do lots of disinfections between farms. It, it's, it's, if you are put, putting a bacteria onto a set of shears and then uh, move to another sheep that might be clean, then there is a chance that that could happen. Um, gross cleaning and, and, disin, and, um, and disinfections, are, are, it's, it's a good question, and it's probably my answer to that is yes. Um, you need to be aware of hygiene and cleanliness between between sheep and certainly between properties and flocks. And, and a lot of people that are doing that initial um, kind of uh, trim where we can get some more kind of um, potential for bleeding and stuff with trimming the foot will often choose to foot bath on the way out of a trim to help reduce some of that, that risk as well. Yeah. Yep. And um, speaking of foot pairing, so I've had another question come through saying, if I see blood when pairing, is that a bad thing? Liz, do you want to, your turn? 
<laughs> yeah, so so as much as possible, we do want to minimise the amount of blood um, drawn when, when hook pairing. So sometimes it is unavoidable, but uh, two things. When we, we trim enough to, to get back to that sensitive uh, tissue that will bleed, we know that we've, we've really um, can cause some pain and lameness in that sheep, you know, when we do that pairing. It all does also open that hoof up to further infection because we've got that open bleeding tissue, which um, is really susceptible to picking up infection. So two things, it is quite painful to the sheep if we cause them to bleed, um, and it also can help to spread diseases. So as much as possible, if we can avoid um, causing bleeding when we're trimming, um, we should do that as much as possible. Absolutely. Um, another question has come through. Do any nutrient supplements help with hardening hooves? Uh, good question. Um, I've actually had, I've, I've been asked, I was asked to speak to a, a, a farmer group about this particular thing. Um, and the question was specifically about zinc uh, as an oral supplement rather than um, a topical treatment. Um, my, there's, some, there's been work done out there uh, many years ago by some good people, Prof Edgerton was one of them, um, looking at whether zinc supplements will, will, will make a difference in expression of foot rot. It didn't in, those, in that particular study and has in, in others. Zinc is a really important, um, zinc is critical in keratin and skin development. Um, it's plentiful in the body, the liver and the muscles have got massive stores of zinc, but also in the skin. Um, it's actually very rare to get a zinc deficiency uh, on pastures. There's a, few places but um, it, it will often present as ill thrift and other things before you sort of start worrying about skin integrity but nonetheless it's been recognised in the dairy industry as that giving a zinc supplement and um, and other trace elements uh, are critical in, in immune systems and, and, and health and they help with somatic cell counts in dairy cows and so we can't you can't just getting your trace elements and your nutrition correct is critical in any immune system in, in any in any health. But I do think, um, you know, unfortunately the reality is that wet conditions, um, we, we don't see zinc deficiency leading to lamenesses in dry conditions. So to me the main cause of foot issues is basically the wet and the spread of bacteria and, and having all those other things in place minimises you know, makes things, all those little things right, but the main causes of foot rot are less to do with nutrition and more to do with conditions and environment. Great, um, and I've had another question come through, which is a great one. Um, can I use the vaccine to extend the time of protection by giving a third dose? Your turn, please. Yeah, yeah, so certainly we know or or from use of the vaccine that we, depending on your environment and the breed of, of sheep that you're treating, that we can get protection anywhere from kind of eight to 16 weeks with the, the vaccine. So if we're gonna have an extended pre spread period beyond that, we can certainly boost up or extend that protection by giving a, a, a third booster shot of that, that vaccine. Great. Well, look, I'm just gonna do the last call out for any more questions. Because uh, you have gone over time by five minutes. Um, but I do want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening. Uh, this session has been recorded, so we will be uh, broadcasting this via our Cooper's Animal Health YouTube channel in the coming days. Um, so, yeah, we'll just give it a few more minutes. And if no one else has any other questions, um, we'll say thank you and, and good night. Oh, hold on, I have one more question. <laughs> Um, how much does the vaccine cost? Yeah, so uh, it, it's, it, it should be just it should be around about two dollars per dose, or just under two dollars per dose, depending on where you go to. But that's that's the uh, we don't we sort of the the, the stores it, it's available through any of your rural outlets. If they haven't got it on the shelf, they can order it in. But yeah, so you look at two dollars a dose, so four dollars if you go to set sheep up with two shots, and then your annual booster after that. So. And I think that's pretty similar with the um, monovalent and bivalent vaccine as well. So, yeah. Great, great question. Well, I think we'll call it there. Thank you, everyone, again. Um, and again, if you've got any questions further to this session, you can reach out to us 
uh, via our 1800 number or via our um, website at cooperzanimalhealth.com.au. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.